future uh, when Christ returns. And you'll see why as we go down through this. And so we're going to kind of wrestle with some of those thoughts and uh, come up with some, uh, uh, some conclusions about that. And uh, as you read down through this, some of you have never heard uh, maybe one of those views, and this might be surprising for you, but I'll lay that out for you as we go along. So I want to begin by just looking at verses 1 through 13, because that's the section of this chapter we're going to be looking at today. And uh, then we'll look at the rest of the chapter over the next two following Sundays. But this Sunday, just verses 1 through 13, and if you have your Bibles out, let's read those verses uh, I'll read them out loud. You can read them silently. It says in verse 1, Mark chapter 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what ma magnificent buildings. And they were. Do you see all these great buildings? Je replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and this is why this chapter and, and the ones that are, you find in the other Gospels are called the Olivet Discourse because of where the setting is here. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately. So four of the uh, uh, apostles came and, and, and wanted to talk to him privately. Verse 4, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. That's important that you underline that, at least in your mind. Verse 9, you must be on your guard. So it isn't like this is all just teaching and no application. There's tremendous application here. And here you see one of the first things. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governments, governors, and kings as witnesses to them, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you arrest, or you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at that time. This is walking by faith. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them all have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Now those are real encouraging words, aren't they today? But notice what it says. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and this passage of scripture has been debated in the church for a long, long time. So we come to it humbly. We come to it looking to you, depending on you to guide us and direct us. But more importantly, uh, not just uh, to gain knowledge of what it's saying, but Lord, that we might take to heart these words. There's warning here. There is, there is something that we need to be aware of. And I pray that we would learn that lesson as we come to these scriptures today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, my grandkids were down, some of you on Facebook who follow Terry know <laughs> that they've been with us. And um, so when uh, they tell us, well, we're, uh, the kids say, we're, we're going to be in at three o'clock or whatever. They're not in at three o'clock. They're in usually at like five or six o'clock or seven o'clock. And so you can't really depend on when they say they're going to be in. And you know why. Those of you who have had a, a bunch of kids, it's hard uh, to get everybody moving in the same direction when you're, especially when you're going on a big trip. And so uh, with Jesus coming, he never said, I'll be, I'll be there in uh, 20, um, whatever, 2021 uh, on a Friday at three o'clock p.m. He never said that. 
In fact, as we know, Scripture teaches uh, that Jesus even doesn't know that hour at this time, uh, which is an interesting thing. Only the Father knows. But right after I trusted Christ as my Savior back as a senior in high school in 1973, so that'll date me, um, people started giving me all these prophecy books to read. And uh, maybe some of you remember it, especially back in the 70s, mid-70s. Uh, a lot of prophecy books were out. And uh, a lot of those people who were writing those books were setting dates. And they were using Daniel uh, chapter 9 uh, to use as kind of a, a, a base for that. And uh, so a lot of them were offering dates, years usually, not months and uh, days, of course, but years. And uh, some of them uh, had determined that 1970, what was it, five or something like that. And, and it all had to do with the, the comet Kohotek, uh, that that was it, that Jesus was coming. So I got excited. I thought, man, this is great stuff. Well, guess what? Jesus didn't come back when the comet Kohotek went flying across the sky. And it was disappointing. It really kind of popped my bubble in, the, in my early Christian life. And uh, I was very disappointed and a little bit, uh, uh, you know, what am I getting myself into? I, it, was, I, it was really a testing time in my faith. Well, what I found out is that, that we can't do that. We can't approach any kind of prophetical teaching and say we know the year that Jesus is going to come back. And now here's the problem, but there's a lot of that going on today. And I think we need to be forewarned before we even get into this chapter. Uh, I will not be setting dates, and I don't think that anybody can. And so I just want to encourage us as we come to the scripture, there's plenty to apply, and that's the whole point. What Jesus is saying is be ready for when I come. It could be any moment, uh, but be ready. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to get ourselves ready by looking at what this passage of scripture says and, uh, and then go forward on that footing. And uh, I think that that is encouraging. So with all that's happening in our world today, it's easy to think, well, Jesus has to be coming back soon. Uh, and I've heard some of you even say that. And uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> And so we want to take what, what Scripture says here. So the first thing, there's three things that we're going to do. We're going to be looking at uh, three sections of Scripture, three sermons or three teaching times, I guess. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 through 13, which we are today. And it talks about persecution and perseverance. Those two things uh, are what we're going to highlight as we go through here. And then in verses 14 through 23 next week, we're going to be looking at the abomination and the tribulation. And then the third sermon will be verses 24 through 27 of this chapter, which will be the second coming. And so that's our roadmap as we go through that. Uh, this Sunday, we're going to be looking at this in three sections as well. And first of all, there's some uh, devastating observation here that's going on in verses 1 through 2. Uh, as the disciples who took a lot of pride in the temple, the temple area, it was a magnificent area. We've talked about this earlier in our study of Mark. Uh, it was a, a remarkable area. And so you see that they, they, look at this teacher, look at the massive stones, look at the magnificent buildings. And so Jesus, I mean, just devastates them when he says, you see all this? Not one stone's gonna be left upon another. Every single one of them will be thrown down. Wow, talk about uh, you know, your bubble being popped. <laughs> this is devastating. And it, it is. It's just downright devastating. And then, though, four of the, the apostles get Jesus aside for some honest questions. Uh, they're just honest. They just want to know. It isn't like they're, they're, they're trying to manipulate Jesus or being facetious. They just want to know. And so they ask Jesus in verses thir three and four, uh, when will these things happen? What will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? And so as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately when these things would happen and um, what will be the sign. And boy, does that sound familiar because a lot of us ask those same questions today. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of the books out there that deal with prophecy, a lot of the authors try to answer these 
I think they're doing a disservice to Christianity uh, because we all want answers like these, don't we? That'd be great. It would, it would be wonderful to know these things, but we really don't know. And so there's a three-part answer that Jesus gives to them in the rest of this section we're going to be looking at. Actually, the rest of, of the, uh, the chapter, and that's the three sermons. He's going to talk about persecution and perseverance, and that's what we're going to look at here first of all. And he starts off in verses 5 through 8 by talking to them about bewaring, be, be aware, beware of signs. I'll get it out. <laughs> beware of signs. That's the first thing he basically is talking about. He, and, you know, he even did that. He even talked about how the Pharisees wanted to, to have uh, signs. And he told them it isn't wise for them to have signs. So Jesus first tells the disciples that their desire for a sign might make them vulnerable to being led astray. And the whole reason is, is, is he talks about people who would come and deceive, people who would come in my name. Who would try to deceive you so here's the problem if you're looking for signs you're going to find signs you understand what i mean there even though they're not signs you'll be looking for anything and everything that will kind of fit in with what you desire what you yearn for what you want and so before you know it you could be deceived because we know that there is a deceiver in this world with a capital d who has great power to pull the wool over our eyes. And so it's not, it's not unusual for Satan to present himself, and Scripture calls him this, as an angel of light. And who's not attracted to an angel of light? And so his followers, uh, his minions, the demons, they can present themselves as good and wholesome beings and if we're looking for signs, if that's what we really want more than anything else, we'll, we will have the, the propensity to follow those signs to the point of deception. And that's what Jesus is warning against. How many tragic situations have occurred when people came along and said, I'm the Messiah. And people followed those quote unquote messiahs even unto death. Many of you remember the Jamestown tragedy and how, oh, just horrible images of those, those bodies that had drink, and drink, 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 drunk, whatever, the uh, Kool-Aid. And uh, it was horrible. And yet he seemed to be such a prophet, such a great leader, and people followed him. And so that's what Jesus is saying. If you are, if signs are so important to you, you're probably going to follow signs to the point of deception because there are deceivers that are in the world and they, they have the capability of doing great things with the powers that they have invested in them through Satan. And so many times we've seen this. And uh, the problem with this, of course, is it, it distracts us from our real mission now which is to, to simply go out into the world and preach the gospel. And it even talks about that, how the gospel has to go back and go out into all the world uh, before Jesus comes back. And so this is a distraction from our mission, but even worse than that, it will, it will cause us, some of us, to, to eventually follow people that are deceivers. And, and that, that totally devastates us from our, our main mission, to build God's kingdom while we're here. So Jesus had warned the, uh, the disciples about the Pharisees asking for a sign. You could look back at chapter 8 real quick if you want to while you keep your finger here and look at verses 11 through 13. Uh, seeking signs, um, and here's, here's the problem with it. They were seeking signs, and here is the Messiah staring them in the face, and they missed them. So signs really aren't a good thing to seek. And yet so many Christians are caught up in this today. And I warn you uh, that, that it's not a healthy thing to set aside the mission of the church, the mission you have personally to reach out to your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, hang with your grace community as you, you challenge one another. And it's hard to do that, I understand. But to stay on focus on, on the real mission that we have here today 
instead of seeking signs of Jesus' return. Don't get me wrong, we should always look for the Lord's return, but seeking signs and looking for, you know, uh, surely the Lord's going to come back this year because of this and this and this. Well, that's dangerous. And so Jesus points the disciples to, to the conditions that lead to the end. You see the difference there? The conditions that, that, uh, that lead to the end. And so they should be settled in the knowledge that these things must be and that they are a precursor to the end. They are not the end themselves. Because it says in verse 7, such things must happen. Not might happen, but they must happen. But the end is still to come. So what does he talk about? Wars and rumors of wars, international strife. Uh, they, but that's not the end. The beginning of, they're the beginning of labor pains. They're not the birth, but the painful contractions preceding the birth. And uh, this is actually a, a profoundly hopeful uh, metaphor that he's using. So when you see things in this world that are going south, and it's, it's not easy to see, maybe even in our own nation here, and, and many Christians are grieving because we don't have the same America some of us feel that we had back when we were kids. And it seems like things are, are becoming godless. There should be a part of you that should be hopeful in that because you know that when, when, when the world moves towards that point when Jesus does return, that the world will become like that more and more. And so it should cause us not to grieve and become despondent and discouraged and depressed. It should cause us to be hopeful because those are like labor pains before the giving birth. And that's, that's the analogy here that I think is very hopeful. It's a very hopeful metaphor. And the, the disciples shouldn't be alarmed when alarming things are happening uh, around them because they are not dying pains, they're birthing pains. We need to keep that in mind. Nothing's worth, worth, worth less than pointless pain. Many of you know I had a, my gallbladder removed a couple weeks ago, and uh, I had a gallbladder attack. Oh, my goodness. Anybody ever had a gallbladder attack? Yeah. Ooh. Talk about labor pains. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know, would I? <laughs> but it was painful. And, you know, it was just pointless pain. There's nothing being gained out of this pain. But, uh, you know, a mother who's pregnant and, and coming to that, that point where the baby needs to be delivered, yeah, it's very painful. Uh, I've seen a woman go through that four times, myself, my wife. And uh, I wouldn't want to go through that. But it, it was a hopeful kind of pain because you knew that something beautiful and wonderful was going to come about because of that. Nothing wonderful and beautiful came about from my gallbladder pain. Nothing. Anyway, we'll move on from that. And so that's what Jesus is saying here. Do you see that? That's what he's saying. He's saying, yeah, it's painful, but it's, it's not dying pains. It's birthing pains because something wonderful is going to happen. I'm going to come back. And this world will become a, a, so much better because of that. And so, you know, after incredible agony, the joy of holding that newborn baby, is it makes it worthwhile. And I just, again, let me redirect your, your grief, perhaps your depression, uh, in what you see going on in the world, maybe in our nation. Will you redirect that towards the fact that this is, these are all labor pains? And uh, it, it, we're giving birth to a time in history when Jesus Christ himself will return and rule and reign on earth. What a time that will be. So keep that in mind as we go through this. These are not dying pains, these are labor pains. And so Jesus describes this on that level. He wants them to know that, stay away from these, these uh, signs, they're dangerous, uh, but simply look forward to my return even when you're going through difficulty. So that, the next thing he does is he talks about persecution and the call to persevere. In verses 9 through 13. Let me read those verses again. So starting up in verse 9. You must be on your guard. So he starts off this section with this, this challenge. Be on your guard. 
you will, you will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel, and here's the priority for Jesus, see, through all of this, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So this is the task, this is the mission, even when we're going through these labor pains, as it were, the, these times of difficulties. And verse 11, he's, he says, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not wor worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at that time. And that's, again, the scary thing because we don't know how God does that. We don't know how God enters into our thoughts and the thoughts uh, are for, for, formed into words in our mind and our lips are used to, to express those. But Jesus can do that. He can give us what we need at that moment. He says, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And then he says, brother will betray brother to death and father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So Jesus doesn't go into detail about particular signs. He focuses instead on the scope of our mission on this earth. Uh, and he said, it'll go so far as that people will actually hate you because of me. You're representing me in this world and they will absolutely loathe you because of it. Now, some of you have run into that from time to time, but this sounds like it's, it's, a, it's happening on a worldwide scale because Jesus said that this gospel needs to go throughout the whole world. And that's really not happened yet. Uh, and so there is the need for us to keep in mind that when we fulfill our mission, it is not going to be just this, this easy, you know, two lane divided highway with no problems at all. Oh, the, the scope uh, and, and, and severity of the persecution is staggering here as we go through this. The, this is true spiritual labor pains for sure. No doubt about it. And it will take place in many different settings. Jewish authorities, it talks about councils and synagogues, Gentile authorities, governors and kings, even family settings. So sad. So sad. The, the hatred and the animosity extends all the way to the most severe sentence, death, persecution to the point of death, being a martyr for Jesus Christ. And it says, again, all men will hate you because of me. So this is what I want, I, I want to uh, end our, our time with today. And it's going to be, in a, it'll be a couple of minutes. I'm not saying we're going to end real quick here, but... Uh, I do want to end with just uh, uh, in the midst of the staggering scope of uh, persecution, Jesus emphasizes three things. And this is what I want to end with. First of all, there's a purpose. And boy, when you're going through something like this, like I said, a woman who goes through, you know, the, the labor pains, the purpose is so that you can give birth to a child, which is a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing. And so there's a purpose for that pain, not the pointless pain that I experienced. So there's purpose. Second of all, there's a promise. We're going to look at that. And then thirdly, there's a call to perseverance. So let's look at the first thing, the purpose. The purpose of this persecution is to provide a, a context in this world uh, for the proclamation of the gospel. Let's not, uh, let's make sure we understand this perfectly clear. Uh, we exist on this earth right now to propagate our faith, to share our faith. There's nothing else that's more important than that. And so we need, to, we need to come to this kind of scripture and ask ourselves in all honesty, is this happening in my life? Am I making disciples that make disciples? That's basically the same thing. And if we're not, we're missing out on the whole purpose for us being here, not only individually, but together as a church. And so this is, this is the context that Jesus uses to really extend the gospel in this world, persecution. The problem that American Christians have is we've been in an, an, an uh, anomaly in this world. Uh, what we have experienced up to this point has been an aberration. 
most of the most of the the church and most of the world wherever it's been has gone through persecution and that's what really fired uh, the faith of the saints that attracted people to Jesus Christ in tremendous ways because they saw the church and how it reacted to persecution during those times so there's a shifting of gears as it were in our country today and I alluded to it earlier some of you who are old enough to know that at one time to be a Christian was what was a status in this society people looked up to you especially if you not only professed your faith but actually lived it out uh, people looked up to Christians who lived out their faith uh, they were they were considered model citizens Christianity was seen as the pinnacle of uh, not only uh, morality and spirituality but ethics all along the line that's changed hasn't it so the aberration is going away and we are becoming even a pariah in our own country now to a lot of people will that change will it change back to what it was i don't know i have no idea and you don't either do you the point i'm making is that with this change of gears we need to change our attitudes too and so we need to realize that we probably are going to have to go forward facing persecution to some degree or another. And when that happens, it's a lot, a lot of times when it's like waking up from sleep, we've had these little grandkids in the house and when they wake up, some of them are kind of cantankerous, you know, because they don't, they don't want, they want what they were experiencing when they were asleep. They want to be, they want to sleep, sleep more. And we've been kind of asleep. You know, we've been enjoying a sweet dream, America. Could that change? Yeah. And it's like waking up. It's like, oh, man, I don't want it. We don't want it. And so we need to, I think it's time for Christians to realize that it could be that's the reality we're going to be living in now. And we need to adjust our attitude. We need to adjust our thinking and say, basically, I need to adjust my thinking to the point where now I want to be faithful to Jesus Christ and persevere through that persecution, whatever it may be, starting out probably very mildly. And who knows where it'll go in this world. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, this is what the world's going to be like. And, and you've got to be aware of this. You've got to be aware of this. You need to be faithful through this. He calls us to perseverance. And so he says in verse 10, this is the thing. God, the gospel has to be proclaimed to all the nations. This is the priority of the church going, God's people going through tribulation or, or persecution here he's talking about now. And he says, it, it's, going to, it's going to get so bad that it, it's, even your own family will be against you at times. And yet we are in a world that we, we have this tremendous opportunity to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That's the context for the proclamation. First of all, there's a purpose behind it. The second thing is the promise. During the persecution, uh, Christ will provide the words for our witness. And here's the challenge to us there. If that's our task, our mission, guess what? Jesus is basically saying with this statement, you don't have what it takes. Do you see that there? That's, that, that's an underlying principle here. He says, in fact, I'm going to have to give it to you through the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean that we're responsible? How, how are we responsible to react to those moments when we have those opportunities? To, to shrink back in fear and say, I don't know what to say. I haven't, I haven't been to seminary. I, haven't, you know, I don't know uh, what, what to say. So I'll just shut up. And that happens in our lives all the time, doesn't it? And yet what, what Jesus is saying is you don't have what it takes to say the right thing. But the Holy Spirit does. And he will give you the words when you need them if you open your mouth and trust him for the words. And so people, even then, walking by faith means you're walking by faith and not by what? Sight. And so you don't know where your foot is going to land the next step you take. 
And so it means that when you're in a conversation and that opportunity comes up, you don't know where your words are going to land the next step, as it were. You simply open your mouth and begin what's, what's in your mind as you yield to the Holy Spirit in that moment. And that means, here's the point, every single one of us can share our faith, right? If God's doing it through us, that is, if, if you're a believer, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, there's not a, a believer in this room, those of you who are watching from home, there's not a single believer who cannot share their faith. Because it's not you doing it, it's the Holy Spirit doing it through you. And so there's a challenge that Jesus throws out for us. You know what? The world may not be the best place to live. It may be difficult. But don't worry. The, the task is, I want the gospel to go out to the whole world. And guess what? All you need to do is open your mouth and speak. You need to be spirit-led, so you need to be walking by faith, trusting in me. But as you do that... Jesus is basically saying, I guarantee you, you'll have the words. And so that's where we reach that challenge in our lives of whether we're going to believe that or not. And that's what Christians are called to do. <laughs> that's the promise he gives us. It's a tremendous promise. It's God's job, not our job to find the words. And I know that that's probably very scary for many of you. It's scary for me too. Uh, and yet that's the promise we have. So when they bring you to the trial or they deliver you to, over to this person or that person or you're at work in this context and that family member of this or that, you know, every context you find yourself, the Holy Spirit's going to be with you. And so there's a purpose for this persecution in this world, the world turning into what it is becoming, context for the gospel going out. There's a promise here. Jesus is going to give us the words. And then thirdly, that's when Jesus says, I want you to persevere. He says in verse 13, who, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And I don't think that's talking about spiritual deliverance there. In other words, salvation from hell. I think it's talking about deliverance uh, in, the, in the context of uh, deliverance to your mission. That's because that's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about heaven and hell. He's talking about this is your mission. This is what it's all about. Your perseverance is necessary so that you get to that end point that you need to be as my follower. And people interpret this phrase in a lot of different ways, but I don't believe it's talking about salvation. It's a, it's, it's a sign of salvation, sure, uh, because believers have the Holy Spirit and when they see the Holy Spirit providing the words, uh, they will be delivered in that sense. And so... I'm not going to go into a whole lot about that, but that's that's the way I see this whole thing going because I, I'm interpreting it in context. If you just take that verse and yank it out of its context, uh, you could probably come up with some idea that uh, if you don't persevere, you're going to go to hell. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. So once again, note the connection between perseverance and hope. Someone can persevere if there is light at the end of the tunnel, if they know that there's an end coming, uh, if one is actually moving towards something worth enduring, and, and many of you have done that in athletically, uh, many of you have done that, uh, you know, uh, with education. Uh, you know, I've gone through education where it's just plain tough, but you know, finally, there's there's that last assignment, or there's that thesis, there's that major paper. There's that final, and you see light at the end of the tunnel, so you pour everything you you have into that into that situation, and you persevere that through that because you see light at the end of the tunnel, and that's what Jesus is saying here. The gospel's got to go out to the whole world, and and so he's going to talk about his his coming in, in just a little bit, and so we're moving towards something wonderful. We're moving towards light at the end of the tunnel, as it were. We're not in heaven yet. We know that. The United States is not heaven. It's not God's kingdom on earth. The elections do not define who God's people are. COVID-19 doesn't change us and alter us and stop us from our mission on this earth. Uh, whatever it is in, in this world that seems like an obstacle that you need to persevere around or through, whatever, we look forward to a better world, a better government, a better hope, a better leader, 
no more suffering, no more heartache, no more unrighteousness. And that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us going. And that's worth our perseverance and our faithfulness in this world today. And so that does bring me to a conclusion here. And I believe that's what Jesus' message is for us today before he moves into this horrible, horrible time of tribulation on this earth. And we'll get into, is this just talking about the Romans coming in 70 AD or, or is this talking about the end times? So we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Are you ready for that? Yeah. All right. So, but Jesus' message today is basically, you know what? It's, it's time to persevere, church. It's time to share the gospel. I'm going to give you every word you need. Do you believe me? It's time to make an impact in this world. I mean world, worldwide. And that's a, that's a tremendous uh, message of hope. Once we accept this and once we accept enduring through any kind of persecution or difficulty, large or small, it doesn't matter, whatever it is, once we start doing that, the church starts moving forward. And that's an exciting concept. And the gates of hell cannot stand in its way. It can't happen. And so we need to shift gears, American Christians. And we need to realize that this is a time we're called for. This is a time that we're called to make a difference in a way that is worldwide in scope. Because we know that there is an eternal kingdom where every tear will be wiped away, every heartache will cease. Man, I can't wait for that world. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. This is, these are weird times for many of us. It's just so strange and different from the world that many of us who are older uh, were used to. And yet, Lord, you knew when we were born in this, into this world that things would be like they are today. And you knew the teachings of Scripture that we would need to hear in order to go forward and make a difference. This is one of those passages. And thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for, for providing many, many years ago the very words that we would need to be encouraged and strengthened and emboldened by. And so, Father, would you help us to accept our mission? Would you help us to trust in you to the point where you do provide the words we need, even though we don't see how in the world we could ever be used that way? When we turn to you in faith, it isn't our faith that makes a difference. It's the power that you possess that makes a difference. And the faith just simply unlocks that energy, that power. Help us to unlock it today as we trust in you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
want to teach you a new song this morning. It's a song that's been out for, I don't know, two or three years by now. But it really, the whole message of this song is that God is with us. And the language of the song moves from that he has been with us, he is with us, and he always will be. And there's a whole lot of gospel intertwined between there and just some neat parallels to some biblical stories of describing how God is with us. And so just with the message in mind today, with our current culture changing, or even with whatever kind of burden you're carrying, whatever kind of brokenness of this world you're feeling at whatever level today, there's hope in who God is. And our God is a God who is with us and is present, and His Holy Spirit fills us and leads us and guides us in so many ways. There is a little bit of a come what may theme to this song as well. And so I just want to encourage you, where you're at today, who God is, and that He is with you. And so if you know this song, of course, sing along with it right away. If not, just enjoy the lyrics, and that God is in the midst of of our battles, our trials, the hardships of this life. He's leading us and guiding us through those things.
Oh
love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me.
is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on high. So God is risen. He is alive.
you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us. You are God's presence. And Lord, what, what an incredible time to just walk through and proclaim that you are our vision. As you lead us, as you guide us, that you're going to be with us in the midst of the storm, the trial, the heartache. But Lord, because of who you are, because of your love, it awakens us to your will, to your kingdom, to your name, those things that we get to live for and be a part of because of you. And so we pray and we declare that you would arise within us, that we would sing your anthem, your will, that we would live boldly and proclaim your name. Things have changed. Things are changing. So, Lord, this morning we just say, come what may. May it not push us to hide in fear, but may it awaken us to the mission of our God who is already victorious. Thank you so much for the reminder that you're with us. Thank you so much for the reminder that you'll give us the words to speak. So may you rise up a willingness inside each and every one of us to see things from a heavenly perspective, to see things from a kingdom perspective, not just an American perspective where we're trying to fight back what we'll never get back. But we fight and press on and push forward in the mission of the kingdom of God. And you promise to be with us. You promise to speak for us. So may our focus be on you. May we seek Jesus. And may we allow you to have full control in and through us. All for your name and for your glory. Thank you, God, for that. I pray you in Jesus' name. All God's people said. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. If you're here in person, feel free to stick around for the Sunday school hour. If not, we hope to see you all next week. Have a great day.